Hi, I'm Rasheem, an independent scholar and social scientist whose scholarship encourages a critical examination of society through a cultural uh, lens of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, pretty much anything to do with um, something connected to identity. Um, also, as an instructor, I'm very much committed to helping students gain a deeper insight into an interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, intersectional approach uh, to the academic study of marginalized populations. Today, I would like to talk to you about reproductive justice and black women. So from the very beginning, uh, from slave masters, economic stake in enslaved women's fertility and the devaluation of black women as mothers to forced experimentation and government programs that coerced thousands of poor black women into being sterilized in the late 1970s, black women's bodies have been a site of violence, objectification, and all of this for the advancement of the U.S. Now, in this conversation, I want to bring up two really main points here. The first one is the reproduction of black women has long been linked to U.S. political economy. And the second point is that the bodies of black women have quite literally been the site of the largest medical advancements in history. Now, to that first point around reproduction and its, connect, and its connection to U.S. political economy. So now historically, both racism and patriarchy gave uh, white women and white men unrestricted authority over the bodies and the reproduction of black women. This particular practice or way of life started with the devaluation of black women as mothers. So. Um, during the same time in American history that white mothers were exalted, black mothers were a commodity, a property. Black enslaved women not having rights over their own body or being able to choose when or where or with whom they would have children was undeniably tied to, US, to the U.S. political economy. Uh, as we know, they were considered property. And no matter who fathered their children, their children were automatically also considered property. So rape of black enslaved women was not only a crime of passion or of power, rape for the purpose of reproduction was in his economic interest. Black women's production of children at that time ensured a continual labor force. Payne states, and this is quoted in the history of social welfare, that exhibiting black women on the auction block was not a benign intellectual exercise, but defended a real material and political interest. Beyond the plantation and, the person, and personal, such objectification meant profit for the Eurocentric world, so long as she was enslaved and had no rights to the children that she produced. But when the white owning class can no longer make a profit from the reproduction of black women, then you start to see a change where her giving birth becomes a burden. So in a very different way, we still are seeing this connection to black women's uh, reproduction to U.S. economy, but just in a different way. Right. So in one way, there was a way in which when you owned her children, it was beneficial to uh, U.S. economy. And then later uh, in history, you see that there's this shift around the more children she produced, the more it produces poverty. Hancock highlights a key role that the Moynihan Report played in painting poverty as a problem that is created by single black mothers. It even gained the support of uh, male civil rights leaders in search of for an explanation of the enduring poverty among African-Americans. Moynihan, then a member of the Johnson administration, cited the work of Frazier and others um, attributing poverty to the pathological structure of the black family. So after the Moynihan report, we start to see more literature in uh, social work and the social sciences with a study on black motherhood, but more specifically, you start to see more words like single mother, welfare recipient, 
Um, all of these things used to shame and silence and even discredit black mothers. The criticizing of single black mothers is not something that is exclusive to one race. Individuals and organizations from both predominantly black institutions and traditionally white institutions cite single motherhood as the cause of poverty and a drain on US economy. So furthermore, you also have this uh, Victorian notions of motherhood that were encouraged not only by white women, but also black elite uh, men whose aim was to prevent the deterioration of the race. In fact, Roberts asserts that the devaluation of black mothering is older than recent poverty discourse. It stems from a racial caste system based on white superiority and racial purity and has endured for over three centuries. Mimi Abramovitz and Diane Pierce identify how poverty is socially constructed to be seen as a female problem. Sexism and racism are regular staples of Western society and has laid the foundation for the povertization of black women. Now, again, I mentioned decades later, when children that black women produce are no longer uh, property of the US owning class, we have government programs that coerce thousands of poor black women into being sterilized as late as the 1970s. They were seen as a drain on the US economy. Uh, in fact, of the 7,600 women who were sterilized in the United States between 1933 and 1973, 5,000 of them were African-American women. Um, in the early 20th century, eugenics believed that measures should be taken to prevent undesirables from reproducing. So that problems such as poverty, substance abuse, would be eliminated from future generations. The second point that I made um, earlier in the video is that the bodies of black women have quite literally been the site of the largest medical advancements in U.S. history. This all starts, of course, with James Marion Sims. Uh, James Marion Sims is today known as the father of gynecology. He has monuments built to him, uh, in entire hospitals, wings uh, named after him, and there's a lot of uh, everything that we know about gynecology uh, stems from his earlier practice. And his practices were deeply rooted in slavery. For years, he performed experiments on enslaved black women without anesthesia under the belief that black people did not feel pain the same way that white people did. So Sims practiced medicine in the early 19th century. Now at this time, of course, there is no uh, gynecology. There is no study or medicine around anything specific to women's bodies. In fact, to do so is considered taboo. Um, and very much undesirable. It's not a thing that if you are want to be taken seriously in a med medical um, field that you would even really consider. Um, his primary role as a medical doctor in the 19th century were really to patch up slaves that have been either, you know, beaten, um, dismembered, disfigured in some way to patch them up so that they would be able to go back to work and either produce or reproduce. That was his main function. And so one day he was called upon to um, give an examination of a woman who had been horseback riding. She was thrown off of her horse and she had injured her pelvic area. Now, in his, in his uh, evaluation of her, he realized he had to look at her vagina in order to treat her. From, uh, from then on, he began being interested in women's bodies and really just treating women medically. Now, he had no training. Again, there was no school of gynecology. It wasn't even a thing. Um, he also had no white women patients because uh, doctors were not really seeing uh, women outside of, for example, the aspect of like childbirth. But what he did have is he had female slaves. And I really want to emphasize that female slaves. Um, and the reason why is because I said earlier that to do any type of experimentation or medical examination of women was considered taboo. But females were like that of, let's say, a cow, a pig or any other uh, chattel animal that you had. The distinction of a woman made her a human being, right? So they considered uh, black women at that time were considered female, but not women. That's a very important dis distinction. Um, 
again, because you couldn't treat women, but you could treat female cows and you could treat female horses. You also couldn't experiment on white women or you couldn't experiment on white people at all, actually. Um, another commonly held belief, again, was that that allowed him to be able to carry out his practice was that black people did not feel pain in the same way that uh, white people did. So you have these you, you have a this um, this social construct that allows him to be able to have this practice. He's not doing it on anyone that's considered human. And um, it's fine because even if you did slightly consider them human because they don't even feel pain in the same way. In fact, he later reflected in his autobiography, which is called The Story of My Life. Um, he reflected about how convenient and great it was that he had ownership of um, female slaves for which for him to be able to do his practice and study. He also did experimentation on uh, the slaves of other um, of other folks and other families at that time, not just on his folks. He began experimenting in 1845 um, on black women and girls. They were typically completely naked, again, no anesthesia, and he would frequently invite other doctors to watch. So two documented examples of this, Lucy and Arnarka. So Lucy, one of the, girl, uh, the black girls that he experimented on, endured an hour long surgery, screaming and crying in pain the entire time while dozens of doctors watch. Afterwards, she actually became ill due to this practice uh, that he, where he used a sponge to drain uh, urine away from her bladder and it led to her contracting blood poisoning. He also noted in his diary about that particular surgery saying how um, her screams were un un unreasonably loud or something to that effect. Then you also have a young woman, Anarka, um, who uh, if you, you could Google Anarka, um, and there's a lot of information around practices that he did with her because she was 17 year old enslaved black girl. He performed 30 operations on her. Again, no anesthesia. How would that be allowed, right? So again, due to his whiteness, his maleness, and the prevailing belief that black people didn't feel pain the same way that white people did, this specific designation of his subjects not being women and girls, but being female, it allowed for him to build not only his practice, but an entire industry, literally on the bodies of black women and girls. I'd also note that the idea that black people feel uh, less pain than white uh, people is a still prevailing idea. A study recently conducted um, the, by the University of Virginia, they published it in April of 2016. It revealed that black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain compared to white Americans. So to one of my first two points, right, about the ways in which black women have quite literally been the site of the largest medical advancements in history. You can't really talk about that contribution without mentioning Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was a tobacco farmer from Southern Virginia. And in 1951, this 30 year old black woman and mother of five visited John Hopkins Hospital and she was complaining of vaginal bleeding. Upon examination, her gynecologist, Dr. Howard Jones, discovered a large malignant tumor in her cervix. At that time, uh, without her consent and also without telling her, he took a piece of that tumor and he sent it down the hall to a scientist uh, there who was working on um, growing tissue cultures um, and had been, they had been working on this for decades without success. The thing that made Henrietta uh, Lacks cells so remarkable is because they didn't die. Now, at the time, Henrietta Lacks cells were the first human cells ever grown. Uh, in culture. They were essential to developing polio vaccines. Um, they went up in space on the first space mission to see what would happen to c cells in zero gravity. Uh, they are used currently to study the effects of drugs, the effects of toxins, hormones, and viruses. Also growth, um, 
growth on cancer cells. All of this without having to experiment on humans. We can see the impact that it would have on human cells because of her cells and because of their immortality, if you will. They've been used to test the effects of radiation and the effects of poison. All of that contribution to the medical and science field that Henrietta Lacks never got to see. She actually ended up dying the very next year at the age of 31. She died poor and her family also uh, never knew of this until about 25 years after Henrietta Lacks died. A scientist discovered that many of the cell cult cultures thought uh, to be from other tissue types, including breasts and prostate cells, were all, in fact, HeLa cells. HeLa is uh, the del delineation that is used to identify cells from Henrietta Lacks. It takes the first two letters of her first name and her last name. So it turns out that HeLa cells could float on dust particles in the air and travel on unwashed hands and contaminate other cultures. It was a really big controversy at that particular time. Now, in the midst of that, one group of scientists tracked down Henrietta's relatives to take some samples with the hopes that they could use the family's DNA to make a map of Henrietta's genes so that they could tell which cell cultures were HeLa's and which weren't. So, and also for the sake of uh, beginning to straighten out the contamination problem. Um, so much of her cells contributed to today. Right, so much medicine of today depend on tissue cells, HIV tests, many basic drugs, all of our vaccines, all of these major advancements in science and medicine, literally from the bodies of black women who for a lot of people are nameless. A lot of people don't know that origin, their families, uh, died poor. Um, Henrietta Lex died at the young age of 31. Uh, she saw no benefit of all of that, but we are all benefiting from it. John Hopkins, um, as a medical institution and as a university, largely benefited from it. The uh, field of medicine also largely benefited from it. But her family and her family's generations to come have absolutely no benefit from that at all. So we have this concept uh, when it comes to black women that I mentioned before, female, but not feminine or woman or girl. So feminine attributes were to be assigned to white women and girls, but not to black women and girls. Again, because that would humanize them and you wouldn't be able to carry out some of the practices, experimentation, exploitation um, and dehumanization if you considered them as full human beings. Black women have not traditionally, again, been, been recognized as feminine or even female, let alone viewed as maternal. So black women who gave birth to children were uh, no more considered maternal than a cow who gave birth would be considered maternal, right? Whoever owned the cow then owned whatever the cow produced. It's milk, it's children, um, or it's offspring in that case. Uh, Sojourner Truth articulates this concept of black women being considered female but not feminine. In her 1851 speech at the Women's Convention, she rebutted a provocateur who commented about how ridiculous it was to uh, assume that women could ever uh, be able to have the right to vote. They're too feminine and frail. They, could, they can't even walk over a, a puddle or get out of a carriage without the assistance of a man. In Sojourner Truth, a uh, former slave pointed out that she had never been helped over puddles or into a carriage. Her words, ain't I a woman, look at me in a room full of white faces because she was the only black person there. Not just the only black woman, but the only black person there. So you have this person saying, women are too fragile, too weak. They can't like, they can't make up their minds about voting. How, they can't even, you know, they're, they're soft and feminine and fragile. And she's saying, no one has ever help me out of a carriage. No one has ever, um, you know, done that sort of thing to me. And her words that she said, ain't I a woman? Look at me, right? So she simultaneously in that moment represented her gender and her race and even her role as a mother. She then, um, it, it's reported that she, you know, revealed her breast and said, you, and, and commented on how she had been a mother and how, 
um, you know, she challenged this idea of female frailty and said without actually saying that it, that her race and her ex status as a slave made her no less a woman than her counterparts. At a time when black women were looked at as mules or cows who could only bear children and do work and do the work of uh, men. So at that time, right, you have this concept that women are so soft and they're frail and they're fragile and they might faint. But then you have this other group of women who are not seen as women who are picking cotton like men, uh, working in the field like men, hauling things like men, uh, doing all of these other things. So you have this like just this um, this way in which she points to that. Right. Their gender was not only uh, was only directly uh, addressed when it was used for sexual uh, sexual reproduction or the production of more slaves. And in that aspect, it wasn't even their gender that was referenced so much as their sex. So back to this point again of uh, black women's reproduction being directly connected to U.S. political economy. During slavery, African-American women were rewarded for increasing their master's workforce. Then later in the early 1900s, black women's birth rate was a matter of national security as efforts of population control were deployed. And you have things come out of that like the eugenics movement. So as mentioned at the onset of this video, my two main points, the reproduction of black women has long been linked to US political economy and the second point is that the bodies of black women have quite literally been the site of the largest medical advancements in history. From slave masters, economic stake in enslaved women's fertility, the devaluation of black women as mothers, uh, to forced experimentation and government programs that coerced thousands of poor black women into being sterilized as late as the 1970s, 1973 to be exact. Black women's bodies have been a site of violence and objectification for the advancement of the United States. 